is pragmatic typology, a multimodal study of Hebrew and French pseudo cleft like structures and interaction, presented by Yael Mashler, University of Haifa, and Simona Pekarek Dollar, University of Neuchatel, Switzerland. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Dorit. Let me just share my screen and begin. Um, yes. Can you see my um, slide? Great. Okay. So, um, first of all, uh, thank you, Dorit, for this introduction and welcome everybody to the symposium Multimodal Studies of Emergent Grammar. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to present some of our findings in this important venue. Um, we'll have uh, three talks this afternoon as detailed um, in the program, one on pseudoclefts, another on clicks, and the last talk on a quotative construction. The studies were all conducted at the University of Haifa within the project From Emergent Complex Syntax to Discourse Markerhood, the Hebrew Grammar Body Interface in a Cross-Language Comparison. Um, this is a project generously funded by the Israel Science Foundation, to which I would like to express my deep gratitude. So without further ado, let's move on to the first talk on pseudoclefts. Now, since submitting the abstract for this talk, our study has been expanded from a comparison across two languages to one across four languages. So Simona and I thought it would be best to present our latest version. So this study is a part of actually an international collaboration on the emergent grammar of clause combining. And the co-authors are myself, Simona pekarek Doler, as the witch said, Jan Lindstrom and Lelo Kivalik. So let me begin. Pseudoclefts have been documented and studied in several languages, perhaps especially in those where they are widespread, such as English, German, French, and Hebrew. As with numerous other complex syntactic patterns, they are as a rule studied on the basis of written sources. In this presentation, we'll also be looking at languages where pseudoclefts are less prominent, and in particular, we'll be studying them in spoken interaction. After presenting the pseudoclef structures in the four languages in a very quick partial literature review, I'll say a few words about our databases. I'll then talk about the formal patterning of these structures in our data, particularly with regard to syntax and lexical semantics. Next, I'll analyze their initial part as a projecting construction based on the embodied conduct of the speaker and recipient. And finally, I'll conclude. Our methodology is that of interactional linguistics. We begin by presenting the pseudoclef structures. According to traditional English grammar, a pseudoclef constitutes a subject verb complement sentence with a WH nominal clause as subject or complement. For example, what you need most is a good rest, don't we all? Or what he's done is spoil the whole thing or to spoil the whole thing. And these are of course examples by Quirk and Greenbaum and Adam. And so we have a bipartite, bipartite structure with part A and part B conjoined by some grammatical linking material, a copula, and also a, complement, a complementizer in the case of a clausal part B, as in what he told me is that they'll make arrangements. Schematically then, we have a what clause followed by a copula and a noun phrase or an title phrase or a that clause. However, Already Quirk and his collaborators noticed that we don't always find all the components of this construction. Incomplete, so to speak, pseudoclefts are traditionally considered non-canonical exceptions and explained away as deviations of the full structure. French, Hebrew, and Swedish manifest syntactic structures that are parallel to English pseudoclefts, as you can see on this slide. While traditional Estonian grammars make no mention of pseudoclefts, our data show the very beginnings of sedimentation of such a structure from use. As for function, traditionally the function of the pseudoclef structure is considered to be the backgrounding of material in part A in order to focus on part B. And there's loads of literature on this, only part of which is mentioned here. However, it's been shown in interactional linguistic studies on English, German, French, and Hebrew, that a more accurate account of these structures 
is that part A functions as a projecting construction, delaying the production of part B for various cognitive and interactional reasons. It also functions to frame the discourse to come in particular ways, which we'll soon see. Finally, it's been shown that there's no functional justification for considering the incomplete varieties of the structure deviations of the full structure, since they're just as capable of carrying out the functions of the so-called canonical structure. We'll therefore refer to all family members of this structure as pseudo-cleft-like structures. Our study is based on four comparable data sets of audio and video recorded casual conversation among friends and relatives in French, Hebrew, Swedish, and Estonian as documented in this slide. The French data show an average of 4.1 pseudoclefts per hour, the Hebrew 3.3, the Swedish 1, and the Estonian only 0.3 tokens per hour and note that we've looked here at 50 hours of Estonian talk. In our data, the construction then is most frequent in French, next in Hebrew, less so in Swedish, and it's very infrequent in Estonian, resulting in the climb you see on the slide. We move now to the syntactic patterning of pseudocleft-like structures in the four languages. Just as the grammatical linking material of the canonical pseudocleft is often missing in English, so in the Hebrew data, for example, we often find, so to speak, non-canonical pseudocleft structures. That is, structures missing the copula, the complementizer preceding part B, or both. So whereas row two, for example, manifests all linking elements between parts A and B, as in what happened is that Mir got a phone call, we also find forms missing the complementizer preceding part B, as in what they did is they took a loan, and we find forms missing the copula, as in what happened, that it came to Rachel, and we find forms missing both copula and complementizers, as in what happened, I got up. And this is the case also in French, Swedish, and Estonian. The elements linking parts A and B are often missing. For this presentation, we've grouped together all canonical and all non-canonical pseudocleft structures. In other words, all the blue rows in one group, all the red rows in another group, for each of the four languages, resulting in the following table. We see that a significant number of pseudocleft family members in each of the four languages is of the non-canonical variety, ranging from 25% in French to 50% in Estonian. Not surprisingly, in the one language whose traditional grammars do not mention a canonical pseudocleft, Estonian, the number of canonical versus non-canonical tokens is equal. Importantly, the more frequent the pseudocleft-like construction in the language, the smaller the percentage of non-canonical structures manifested by it. In other words, again, we have the same line along the four languages of French, Hebrew, Swedish, and Estonian. This suggests that as the pseudocleft structure becomes more widespread in the language, part A becomes more attached to part B, supporting Koops and Hilpert's findings on pseudoclefts and Hopper's view of grammar as emergent and epiphenomenal. Let's now examine the lexico-semantic makeup of the A part in our pseudoclefts. Hopper and Thompson found that the most frequent predicates in part A of the English pseudoclefts in their data are the verbs do, happen, and say, showing that in 87% of the cases, part A functions as a formulaic fragment classifying upcoming discourse as an action, as in what we're going to do, event, as in what happened, or a paraphrase of what has been said before, for instance, what I'm saying. Interestingly, the most frequent predicates in the A parts in our four data sets are generally the semantic equivalents of these do happen say verbs, but these account for a much smaller percentage of the tokens compared to the figures in Hopper and Thompson's study. A significant percentage of A part predicates in our four languages are employed to display a stance, usually affective but sometimes epistemic, concerning what's about to be verbalized in part B. And you can see some of those predicates in this table, for example, what's difficult, annoying, nice, important, scary, good, cool, amusing, exciting, interesting, or what I think, wonder, like, want, forget, and so on. 
And here you can see the relevant portions of do happen say predicates versus stance taking predicates versus other type of predicate in the four languages. While in French and Swedish, in our data, the stance taking category is the largest, we see that in all four languages, this category is considerable. In Hebrew and Estonian, in our data, the do happen say category is the largest. But in all four languages, the other category is generally relatively small. This shows that in all four languages, the A part has sedimented to a fairly great extent as a fixed fragment, either classifying upcoming discourses an action event or paraphrase of what has been said before, or as a fragment displaying the speaker's stance concerning his or her upcoming talk. So in sum, this lexico-semantic and syntactic consistency in the patterning of part A in the four languages and the frequent absence of grammatical linking elements co-occur to indicate some degree of routinization or sedimentation of part A. It's functioning as a projecting construction and specifically for projecting upcoming talk as doing some reporting of actions or events or for doing rephrasals or as displaying the usually speaker stance towards some issue at hand. We've now shown that the syntactically disconnected A parts occur across all our languages. Two concrete instances, one in a language in which pseudoclefts are relatively frequent, another in a language in which they are rare, will now be shown to illustrate the status of the A parts as projected constructions. Furthermore, we'll use those two examples to show the accompanying gestural behavior that is coordinated with the A parts constituting them as major junctions of re-engagement. In the following Hebrew interaction, a couple is planning the errands for the next morning, Friday. Before the excerpt we're about to watch begins, Alon mentioned that he'd like to prepare the dough for the challah, that's bread traditionally eaten on Sabbath Eve. This opened a long discussion of who's making what for dinner and who's coming to dinner. At the beginning of our excerpt, Alon mentions that he'd also like to go to the Shilav baby goods store the next morning. Let's watch. Right before this excerpt, Hillel had questioned Alon's choice of shopping for baby clothes Friday morning of all mornings because of the crowds. Alon counters this, saying he'll go early in the morning before the crowds get there. He closes the sequence in a decrescendo and final intonation contour. He then returns to the list of errands which he had begun exactly 100 intonation units earlier. It is at this point that part A of our construction will be produced. Following a click, an inhale, and the discourse marker begadol in general, comes part A of a potential pseudocleft. What I must manage to get done. The kernel of the extended verb here is lasot, to do. Framing the upcoming discourse is a telling of future actions. Indeed, following a continuer from his recipients at 120, Alon begins part B listing the things to do. I want to make the dough for the chala and and you see that no copula or complementizer precede this B part, which ends up being longer than a clause. Now the baby begins to sob and Alon's list gets interrupted. Nevertheless, we see the strong projection of this A part. Let's examine the embodied aspects of its production. Alon has been lying, leaning his head on his right hand throughout the preceding lines. At the click of 116, he raises his head and begins to turn it looking to his upper right so that at the end of 118, it looks like this. Throughout the verbalization of part A of the potential pseudocleft, he makes a sweeping motion with his right hand from left to right, as in the two figures in the bottom of the slide. Let's watch just this in motion. <laughs> We argue that it's the strong projection of part A, accompanied by the speaker's prominent embodied conduct, that draw the recipient's attention to Alon's upcoming telling of his future actions. The projection is so powerful 
that there is no need for any grammatical glue in the form of copula or complementizer. In fact, part A functions here in some ways more like a discourse marker projecting over a long stretch of talk in a cluster with two discourse markers rather than as an initial clause in a biclausal structure. And indeed, the recipient has become engaged. Note that Hillel follows this A part immediately with a continuer. Mm -hmm. And in this way, he manifests his recipiency and engagement in the upcoming talk, despite his sons beginning to wake up, identifying the discourse projecting potential of this A part. Let's now have a look at a rather similar Swedish case. This excerpt comes from a conversation between two friends, Yolanda and Anna, seated at a high table in Yolanda's apartment. Yolanda has been telling about a trip to another town where she participated in a student party. Before the beginning of this segment, Anna has left the table to take a bottle of water from the fridge, and when returning, the participants have started to talk about the furniture in the room. And you can see Anna still looking in the direction of the sofa to the left. Let's watch. The digression about furniture ends in line eight with pauses and Yolanda's disclaimer, I don't know, said in English and accompanied by a non-lexical vocalization something that sounds like two or something like that, and a gaze away. Next, she poses a question to resume the earlier topic. What was it that we were talking about? Followed by a thinking pause. Yolanda then remembers that she had talked about her trip to the town Vasa. In line 14, Yolanda produces part A of a potential pseudocleft, what I was going to say yet, to introduce the following part of her narrative, how her trip back home was. This unit is preceded by a change of discourse markers, literally yes, but, and it serves as a metapragmatic move referring to saying. It's constructed as something that the speaker was in the process of doing earlier, skuseia, was going to say. The addition of the adverb enu, yet or more, at the end of the line, underscores that there was something missing and needs to be said. Simultaneously with the pseudocleft A part, Yolanda lifts her arm halfway up, waving her hand slightly and pointing towards Anna with the index finger. What follows as part B is not a canonical pseudocleft constituent. There's no copular verb, and the clausal unit is a syntactically independent stretch of discourse, which then becomes an extended telling. The metapragmatic A part appears in this sense to be a formulaic fragment. Anna again takes a recipient position and follows the A part with a continuer at line 16, identifying its discourse projecting potential. And here we have a further stretch of Yolanda's telling. As she has established her continued narrative, Yolanda's hand and arm have been still in an upright position. And in line 21, she retracts her arm finally to a rest position when continuing with her interactional project. To sum up, both in the Hebrew and Swedish examples, the A part of a pseudocleft is launched to engage the recipient in the speaker's interactional project. The construction is preceded by discourse markers, and the A part functions as a formulaic fragment that projects more to come, and in addition, gestural cues are used to re-engage the recipient. To conclude, We've shown that existing findings concerning pseudoclefts are applicable also to Swedish and Estonian, languages where this structure is marginal. We have shown that the more widespread the pseudocleft structure is in the language, the more attached part A is to part B along the following climb. A cross-linguistic comparison of part A suggests that there is a strong tendency for it to display specific lexicosemantic features such as do happen say verbs and stand taking predicates. And finally, we have begun to explore how projecting A parts are coordinated with larger gestures and gaze behavior, suggesting that those multimodal assemblies 
organize mutual engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Yale, for adhering to the times and for this very interesting talk. Uh, it's time for the no, okay, no questions so far. Please, panelists, raise your hand or speak up. Questions. Uh, may I ask a question I mean, during the meantime? Are there typological reasons for these findings? What do you think? Uh, what do you mean by that, Stuart? I mean, are there specific characteristics of uh, syntax and preferences for cert certain constructions in these languages they would, that would account for these uh, tendencies? Well, actually, you know, the point is that we have here languages from three different typological families. We have a Semitic language, two Indo-European languages, and then a Finno-Ugric language, Estonian. And yet, in all these three typologically different languages, we find similar structures or uh, beginnings of such structures and similar behavior multimodally. Okay, so you would say that this is something that is shared across languages according to... Uh, well, I wouldn't want to say across all languages because yeah, I don't know what this for, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the interesting thing here is that uh, the from use, from the interactional um, features of uh, use, the, we find similar patterns emerging across typologically distinct languages. Great. Mira would like to ask a question now. Hi, Ael. Thanks for Hi. the talk. Um, so I was curious about the differences between the languages. In other words, the stance dominant languages and the action dominant languages. So do you think, I wouldn't go as to cultural differences, I think. Do you think it's just the way, since we talk like others talk, if it so happened that the dominant first examples or whatever that spread around where stance for one type of language and action for another, that's how it proliferated? Or what would you say the difference is? I mean, stance is different, is important to all of us. Action is important to all of us. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, I, th I think that uh, in, uh, you know, we ha I have another study with uh, Stav Fishman about he the structure in Hebrew of Hebrew pseudoclefts in a completely different genre in political phonins uh, to the radio. And there you see a completely different distribution of predicates in the A parts. So a lot has to do with the genre in which um, the interaction is taking place. We tried as best we could to uh, only take casual conversation among friends and relatives for our study to make you know, the genre constant, to keep it constant. But I have to say that we had so few tokens in Estonian that there are some examples there from like Pilates classes and uh, other forms of um, instructional um, interactions. So I think the genre here really matters. Um, I don't really have a good, a good answer for you, uh, Mira, about you know, why is it that in some languages, I'm not even sure that it's true that in some languages it's more action verbs or do happen say verbs and in some languages it's more stance taking predicates. I'm not sure it's really that or a function of the data that we used. Uh, I don't think we have much more time, but there is one more question about making the environment natural. Uh, in the, with the microphone and the camera, how are you sure that the speaker has had the natural, natural conditions? Please, very in brief. Okay. Well, yeah, this is always a question uh, when you record data. And of course, when you record it by audio, you are less intrusive than when you're recording by video. Um, I cannot say that the interactions are 100% natural at all times. 
But I can say that experience shows that over time, speakers do tend to forget, or at least in parts of their interaction, tend to forget that they are being recorded. And we have quite natural conversations in our corpus, I would say. Okay, 